again, I'm Julie. I'm a genetic counselor. I'm part of the team here. And I'm going to talk to you today about my favorite topic, which is genetics. And I know you're all really excited. You woke up this morning and said, I cannot wait to come to Kennedy Reader and hear about genes and chromosomes. But I promise I'm going to try to make it interesting and relevant for you because there have been some pretty exciting developments in our understanding of the genetics of FSH in the last few years and even the last few months. So the outline of what I'm going to go over today, I'm going to start with just a little bit of the basics to make sure we're all on the same page about what genetics is, and then talk specifically about the genetics or the genetic pathogenesis of FSH. Then I'll review the inheritance of FSH, and lastly talk about reproductive options for people with FSH um, thinking about having children. So just to remind ourselves of the basics, I know you guys have heard this before, we learned it in high school, we learned it in college. I was, I get, I'm getting some head shakes. Okay, so we did not learn this before. So, but what the basics of what you need to know, so when we talk about DNA, DNA is just the, um, it's just the alphabet of our genetic information. It's a series of letters, A, T, G, and C, these chemical letters that spell out the instructions for our body to grow and develop and function. And a gene is a segment of DNA that's the instructions to make a particular protein or enzyme or signal in our body. And then chromosomes are the structures that contain our DNA all coiled up, packaged together in the center of every cell, and that's what we pass on from parent to child. So that's everything you need to know about genetics in 30 seconds. So in the center of every cell um, are our chromosomes. So this is the nucleus of the cell, and our little chromosomes are in there. And if you spread them out and look at them under the microscope, it's called a karyotype, and this is what it looks like. We have 46 chromosomes total, and they come in pairs. And we just number the pairs 1 to 22, and then the last pair is the sex chromosome. So ladies, we have two Xs, and gentlemen have an X and a Y, shown down here. And, but inside these 46 little chromosomes, there's an enormous amount of genetic information. There's 3 billion DNA letters and over 20,000 genes. So just a huge amount of information packed into each little cell. And a problem anywhere in there, even as small as a change of a single DNA letter, could potentially cause issues with growth or development or functioning, depending on what that gene or that chromosome is supposed to do. So the chromosome that we all know is important in FSH is number four. And um, yes, yeah, that's my transition. So um, talking about the fourth chromosome, which is what's related to FSH. So FSH was first described clinically by, I think, two French neurologists in the late 1900s based on the, the clinical features of the, um, of the mus muscle issues. And then it really wasn't until around 1990 when the FSH locus was mapped to chromosome 4 subtelomere, meaning they had a bunch of families of people with FSH and they figured out that the chromosome that it was tracking with was number 4, and it was at the very tip of chromosome 4. And then two years later, it was published that FSH is associated with certain DNA rearrangements at the very end, at 4Q35. And then the next year, it was figured out that this deletion is caused by repeat units at 4Q35. So if we take a zoomed in look there, so this is showing chromosome four. So every chromosome, the middle part of the chromosome, that pinched in part is called the centromere, and then the ends are called the telomeres, up here and down here. And then each band is numbered outward from the centromere. So there's two arms. So this top arm, the P arm is the short arm, P is for petite, and then the bottom arm is the Q arm, Q is the long arm. So each band is numbered. So we're talking about band 4Q35. And if you take a zoomed in look there, there's a region where there's a series of, a stretch of DNA that's repeat a whole bunch of times. So these little triangles represent about 3,000 DNA letters, about three kilobases, 3,000 DNA letters. That's repeated a whole bunch of times. And it's normal to have a whole bunch of repeats there. Most people in the general population have anywhere from 11 to 100 repeats. But what was discovered is that most people with FSH seem to have a fewer number of repeats there. We call that a deletion, or sometimes it's also called a contraction. And I might use those words interchangeably, but it's the same thing. Deletion and contraction, same thing. You you're, have too few units there. So that was all fine and good. And how the, the main genetic test for FSH works is by measuring the size of this region. So they use something in the lab called a restriction enzyme, which sort of clips on either side of the deletion region. And then they run it across something called a southern blot, and they can measure and see how big are those little fragments. 
And so we know that normal size fragment is around greater than 42 kilobases kb. And if it's anything less than 38 kbs, that's considered abnormal or associated with FSH. And then some labs have this borderline region where they say, well, we're not really sure if it's normal or not, so we'll let you figure it out based on a person's clinical symptoms. Does that make sense so far? So then, a little bit later, we, and when I say we, I mean the general scientific community, not myself personally. I was very young when most of these discoveries were made. Um, was figured out that there can be some people who have FSH and have this deletion or this contraction, but, um, sorry, let me say that a different way. There are some people who have this deletion but don't have any symptoms of FSH. And it was determined that a nearby DNA sequence, something called a haplotype, is also necessary. So haplotype just means a, a sequence of DNA. And there's two haplotypes. There's the A haplotype and the B haplotype. And it was found that all people with FSH have the A haplotype. And people who have the B haplotype, even if there was a deletion, they don't have FSH. So that was determined to be important. But for a long time, we didn't know why. OK, okay deletion plus A haplotype equals FSH. But we don't know really why either of those things actually cause FSH. Usually when we think of genetic disorders, we think, well, you have a mutation in a gene, and the gene doesn't work, therefore you have a disease. But at FSH, it's, we're not missing a gene here. So it was not clear how this, how this was causing a problem. So we, there were a number of unanswered questions. How is it that this deletion ultimately leads to FSH? Why is that bad for the body and for the muscles? Why do some people with the deletion not have FSH? And why do some people with FSH not have a deletion? Because there was a, found to be a group of people that are labeled FSHD2 who clearly have FSH based on all of their symptoms, but no deletion. So what's going on there? So there must be more to the story. And over the course of the next 20 years, people were working very, very hard to figure out those answers. And now we've figured out a lot of those things. We don't have it all figured out, but we've come a long way. So our current understanding is that FSH results from inappropriate expression of a gene called DUX4. So DUX4, it stands for double homeobox 4. And this gene is a transcription factor, which means that it controls the expression of other genes. It's kind of like the conductor of the orchestra. It says, OK, you genes over here, I want you to do your thing now. You guys over there, stay quiet. Please don't do anything. And DUX4 is normally only expressed in the germline, which means the eggs and the sperm, very, very early on in development. And at all of their times, and all of their cells and tissues in our body, DUX4 is supposed to be turned off and quiet and not doing its thing. We don't know exactly what the normal function of this gene is, but we know that whatever it does, it's only supposed to do it early on in the germline, not any other time in our bodies. It was discovered that muscle cells from people with FSHD show some expression of DUX4. So the thinking is that when this gene is misexpressed in the muscle cells, DUX4 activates many, many genes that aren't supposed to be turned on at that time. Either. It's like the conductor of the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra showing up at the Met and conducting that orchestra at 5 AM on a Saturday. Nobody's there to listen. It's not what's supposed to be happening. So it's the wrong expression at the wrong time. That sort of makes sense okay, so far. Have I put anyone to sleep yet? I hope not. OK. All right. So, so I keep talking using this word expression, gene expression. So how do genes get expressed? So a gene is a chemical sequence. Like I said, it's DNA. And that DNA sequence is transcribed into a related chemical message called RNA. And that RNA message is then translated into the protein. I'm telling you this for a reason, I promise. So DNA is transcribed into RNA. RNA is translated into protein. And there's many um, things that control or are necessary for that process of transcription and translation to happen. This is where we get into the whole epigenetics. Good stuff. And genes may only be active in certain cells or tissues at certain times during development and throughout the lifetime. So it's not that all 20,000 genes are on at the same time, but it's a very um, carefully orchestrated uh, when some genes are on and some genes are off. And there's very complex mechanisms that control gene expression, and it would take weeks to explain all of them to you, and I don't even understand them all, admittedly. But the ones that are important for FSH is something called chromatin condensation. So our, remember, our chromosomes contain our DNA, but it's not like there's two long pieces of DNA that are just in an X that make up a chromosome. The DNA is very 
tightly coiled together. And these little strands in here are called chromatin. And in order for a gene to be expressed, that chromatin has to unwind so the DNA can be open and exposed, that then the machinery can come along and turn it into RNA and protein. Another way that gene expression is controlled is through something called methylation, which is a chemical modification, where if a gene is methylated, it can't be expressed, but if it's unmethylated, it can be expressed. And then transcription factors, like DEX4 is a transcription factor, a signal that says, okay, you turn on then and you turn off then. So those are a few examples of how genes get expressed, and those examples are relevant for FSH, as I'll explain. So, as I said, uh, FSH results from inappropriate expression of this DUX4 gene. So where is DUX4? DUX4 is actually located inside of those units. So these little D4, Z4 repeat units, the little triangles, each one of those little triangles contains one copy of DUX4. But normally DUX4 isn't expressed because this region, this repetitive region, is highly methylated and the chromatin is condensed. So it's very tightly packed there. And, so, and furthermore, DUX4 is missing something called a polyadenylation signal. So the RNA transcript is unstable and gets degraded. So when DNA is turned into RNA, there has to be a little tail of A's at the end to keep it stabilized so it can be translated. Without that little tail, it just unravels and gets degraded and doesn't get turned into anything. So those are two key things missing here. The deletion on this array what it allows to happen, it causes the chromatin to relax and to become unmethylated, hypomethylated. And then this haplotype, the permissive haplotype 4QA, contains a poly A signal. So those two things together, if you have a deletion that allows the chromatin to be relaxed and unmethylated and the little poly A tail, it allows this duct score gene to be expressed. So it's sort of like a perfect storm of things happening. So this is another kind of diagram showing here that normally you have a nice long number of repeats and the chromatin is tightly packed together and it's methylated, so you're not going to get any protein. But when there's a contraction to less than 10 repeats, it becomes hypomethylated and the chromatin relaxes. And if you have this A haplotype that contains a poly A tail, the copy of DUX4 in the last repeat can get transcribed and translated and expressed into this DUX4 protein that then causes a whole bunch of problems downstream. So, that's a lot of information I just gave you. But the short version is that, again, it's this deletion and a haplotype that leads to expression of DUX4. So, that was a big mystery solved, right? Finally, after 20 years, it was figured out why this deletion matters. But it still didn't answer the question of what about these individuals who don't have a deletion. They have a normal number of repeats, and yet their cells are still expressing DUX4. And, but what these individuals do have in common with FSHD1 is that they also had reduced methylation and their chromatin was relaxed. And they had the A haplotype. So this was a mystery until very, very recently, just a few months ago, a paper was published, and it was discovered that individuals with FSHD2 have a mutation in a completely different gene a gene called SMCHD1, which stands for, you don't remember this, structural maintenance of chromosomes, flexible hinge domain containing one. Aren't we very creative with our gene names? Right? SMCHD1, the SMC gene. So what this gene's normal function is, is to keep this D4Z4 array, this repetitive region, to keep it methylated. So if a person has a mutation in that gene, and it's not, it's going to be unmethylated all the time. So if a person has a mutation in this gene and they're unmethylated, and they also happen to have the 4QA haplotype that contains the poly A signal, then DEX4 will be expressed. So this is a, a nice picture summarizing that we have two different genetic markers on chromosome 4 and in chromosome 18. And in the normal situation, you have more than 10 repeat units and you don't get any gene expressed. But in FSHD1, you have a contraction and, that, and the A haplotype, and that's how you get the DUX4 expression. Whereas in FSHD2, you don't have a deletion, but it's, you're missing this gene, and that's how you get the RNA expression. So that's our current understanding of the genetics of FSH.